So there is a Republican opinion in all this. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. All this being the way that we spend the money, nearly $10 billion in taxpayer money on a federal and state level. The encouraging thing for folks, if you really pay attention to this, is that it's only about $4 billion of locally raised money, if that makes you feel any better. Uh, but that's what it's going to cost to, to run Rhode Island in the next fiscal year, beginning July 1st. Uh, the Republicans, you know, make their stands on certain issues and have perspective, and we always check in with them. And Blake Filippi is the minority leader, and you'll meet him momentarily. You've seen him before, and you'll see him again. A couple of things I just wanted to start with. Jim Terracani passed away this weekend. And I, uh, his uh, his uh, wake is Wednesday, and his funeral is Thursday. This neat little thing happening where uh, journalists are going to form kind of an honor guard for him and a symbolic uh, protection of the First Amendment. Uh, be that as it may, uh, Jim Terracani was um, a lot of things, uh, and amongst his character, character tributes, I think, uh, was the idea that he was a fierce defender of the story. I'll never forget in Plunder Dome uh, during the CNC trial when Judge Ernest Torres, you know, put the hammer down on him to unveil a source in his reporting, and he wouldn't. And I uh, wrote an editorial in the Providence Journal at the time talking about it as if it was the irresistible force and immovable object. Uh, choose which one you want to be in that, in that, uh, in that program. But uh, there is no doubt in my mind that uh, Judge Torres wasn't going to get an inch from Terracani and back and forth. And I bumped into Judge Torres uh, not too long after I wrote that. And he said, you were right. And he understood. But he put Jim Terracani in home confinement for four months. Uh, Jim got a lot of a lot of action from that, a lot of accolades and a lot of attention, and all well deserved. He did a lot of speaking about the defense of the First Amendment and source protection. Uh, he was tenacious on the ground. He he had a he has a resume that is hardly listable here. Uh, but more than all of that, uh, for a guy who just came into town some 20 years ago and bumped into him and guys like Jack White uh, at these events, when a talk show host decided that he was going to start spending time at press conferences and act journalistically. Uh, never, uh, never uh, a nary look, never a, uh, what are you doing here? Always a, a kind word and a commiseration. Uh, as, as well known and as tough as he was, he brought a level of humility to his job and to his life uh, that was notable. Uh, Godspeed to him, uh, Lori White, his wife, condolences. And uh, this community is far lesser having lost Jim Terracani. God bless him. Uh, on a federal note, the, the president is, uh, you know, firing away rhetorically at Iran. We have headlines here. Iran's lashing back. Uh, I know a lot of you are just kind of desensitized to everything that has to do with Washington and Trump, but pay attention to this because this is a real problem. Uh, we don't have a, a concerted and consistent idea coming out of Washington, you know, and the president's actually making fun of the idea that he's got a hawk in John Bolton, his national security advisor, that if he had his way would have just, you know, bombed Iran, more or less, my words, but I think you get the point. It is, uh, it, I'm telling you, you know, that he pulled back the attack last week and, and played it like it was The Apprentice, you know, reality television ought to give us all a lot of pause. Not much we can do about it right now, but, you know, as a citizen, you need to pay attention because he seems to react to feedback, and he should get plenty. Uh, this story, real quick, <clears throat> this was last week's story, if you will, that uh, had the Speaker of the House remove a million dollar line item from the Medicaid budget after it was reported out by Ted Nisi of, of WPRI.com and Target 12 that it didn't jive with the governor's uh, removal of the line item. It seems that they've been paying this doctor and this chiropractor in Cranston between legislative and community grants and um, former Medicaid line items for years, uh, millions of dollars, you know, for patients patients bill, their Medicaid patients, he sends the bill uh, to the state Medicaid administration. This is one of 25 uh, entities 
that would like to be paid that way, that were paid that way, meaning the state has turned down 24 of 25 arrangements for this kind of payment. For a specialty line item to be in the budget this way is outrageous, and the Speaker of the House needs to know that. And I think he does. And so while I talked about this last week, you're thinking, isn't this the same conversation? I found on Friday night, we uh, ran a repeat program last night, so this is the first time I have a chance for you to, to, to hear this. I found on Friday night that the speaker was not protesting too much. In fact, he got into a tangle with Ted Nisi himself over the veracity of his report. Listen to this. What I've said is it's being politicized, Ted, and a lot of things in the budget are, are billed exactly the same way, and you didn't get the information from people, and you didn't organize groups and do things like that. So it, You're saying question, I did or I didn't? I said you media generally. Someone did. I don't know who I did I read it. the budget, and I saw a line item right. that said the federal government was not covering one of the only Medicaid items that aren't that. That's not a political attack. That's just people I, trying I, to report I, on the budget. Uh, that conversation got worse, not better, where Ted had to stick his, uh, his, his flag in the ground and say, hey, listen, this was legitimate organic reporting. And the speaker decided to try to paint a picture that suggested that he was doing the, my words, dirty work of, of people out to get him. Uh, the speaker operates this way all too much. If you disagree with him, you have to have an ulterior motive. And you must be looking for some kind of bada-bing. There's got to be a bada bing. Like there's a bada bing out there that causes this to happen. If he felt so strongly that this program should have stuck, he should have defended it and kept it in the budget and argued for it. Instead, he said, all you people are just screwing up these Medicaid patients, but I got to pull it because it's too political. There's a lot of private equity money out there in the medical world that could have been generated to advance the industry of the CIT treatment that this chiropractor was trying to get into. You don't use the state budget as equity seed money to try to develop an efficacy to prove that Medicaid ought to cover this whole thing. It's really backwards. I think it needs more scrutiny. And the idea that he tried to blame a reporter for just doing his job as if he was part of a group trying to get him is disgusting. The minority leader is Blake Filippi. I know that you had $10 billion worth of concern and that he pulled this thing didn't necessitate you to have a floor debate on it. Did you sense, by the way, welcome, good to see you. Thank you, Dan. Did, 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 you, did you feel last week, you know, with this little mini drama going on, that there was going to be a big turbulent battle on the House floor over it? I thought that if it wasn't pulled, there would have been a turbulent battle. Because you had been, what, making some of the points that I am making uh, about the unorthodox minimally and questionable practices of this budget item? So I, I don't have all the facts to say the extent to which it's questionable. I think that when you have government essentially trying to act like a VC, venture capital firm, mm. that bad things can happen. And whether this was un the level of untowardness, I, I don't know. I don't like government saying that there's this burgeoning industry that we need to invest in. And when you have a $10 billion budget and a lot of that money is used to support economic development, things can go awry. To your, that's a really great point because we do at least have targeted budget items that you may philosophically disagree with and I may philosophically disagree with in terms of economic development where we say, okay, here's $20 million in incentives, here's you know the, uh, the, the tax reduction plan, here's all of this. The governor's big on picking winners and losers yeah. this way. But at least it's telegraphed, it's explained exactly what it is, and it's in the category of the government investment in business development spending. This was just a hidden Medicaid item, and his defense is, well, we're trying to build an industry on this treatment. I'm oh, sorry. There's too much medical money out there. If you've, got a, if you've got a treatment that, and this guy's been working on this thing for 10 plus years, if you've got something good, go get the money, invest, you know. And, and if you've been doing it, 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 it for 10 years, why haven't you been able to get the Medicaid approval over that time thank period? Thank you. Right? Infuriating. Uh, but you didn't have to debate it. No, it was pulled out. Uh, it was telegraphed that it would be pulled out. We would have debated it. I know members of the Reform Caucus were planning on debating it. I was just but he would have won that debate when he just told everybody to pass it. So the point is, he shoved a lot of stuff down your throat over the course of the years. This one wasn't worth the fight. 
which was why I think more than just the legislature should be looking at this. When we come back, we'll get into the Republican perspective on things that they think about. Stay with us. Well, the total just gets higher and higher. Here's the Eyewitness News summary of last weekend. Lawmakers back on the House floor on a Saturday after a late night Friday. Still left on the table, a number of articles in the $10 billion budget. A big part of Saturday's discussion was about Article 15, which is about medical marijuana policy in Rhode Island. Right now, there are three dispensaries known as compassion centers in the Ocean State. The article would pave the way for six more. Some of the concern was over adding more compassion centers when the number of medical cannabis patients isn't increasing. Questions came up about what growers are then to do with their product. We are putting local businesses out of business here. We're talking about an industry that we invited to come and invest in our state. And look at the message we've sent to them. While legalization is not an option for lawmakers right now, Deputy Speaker Charlene Lima responded, saying this is a step in that direction. So Representative Tansy, what you need to realize, if it gets into legalization, it's not going to be just 18,200 people. It's going to change to hundreds of thousands of people. So I needed to make that distinction. But Lima also warned, as the marijuana industry expands, Rhode Island needs to keep a very close eye on it. I warn you today, this will be another 38 studio, studio debacle with indictments in years to add. Also in the budget, which passed 64 to 9, $200,000 for the Nonviolence Institute, a Providence nonprofit which works to prevent gang violence. Earlier in the week, that money had been stripped and no longer in the budget. One million dollars previously earmarked for a Cranston chiropractor lawmakers had allocated money to in the past. Okay, uh, Char thinks that th seems to think we got a 38 studios on our hands with this marijuana thing. Have you looked closely into the whole situation? I, I don't know that I want to use that moniker yet. I just think what we're doing is bad policy. You know, we invited Rhode Islanders to become cultivators. We have, I think, 43 cultivators that collectively have invested. And they're freaking out. $20 million of investment to become cultivators, soft costs and hard costs, building out the facilities. And now we're authorizing six new compassion centers, but we're also allowing them to be cultivators where they can produce their own product, vertically, vertically, vertically integrate, produce their own product, and sell their own product. Yeah. So what happens to the people, the Rhode Islanders, well, who invested just, $20 it, million? Dollars? My God, can you imagine that the state of Rhode Island doesn't have a cohesive strategy on, on the marijuana issue? Not on this at all. This is a last-minute flyby for the fall down, some think, on the legalization of marijuana. I've been ambivalent about that the entire way. I've never felt like, just because Mass has done it, that all the data is in and that we needed to do it. I don't know how you feel about that. No, it's de facto legal now, in my opinion. It's everywhere. Yeah, but... Uh, so you would have voted yes on a legalization of marijuana? A smart legalization process I would have. You know, one that had some regulation to ensure quality, one that included the proviso that if you sell to children, you have to spend time in jail. You know, you can put reins on something like this. Use the way the alcohol distribution is regulated. One person, one license, hmm. a lot of regulations. You have to sell good product. Why did it fall down? I think the concern, and this is a very, very legitimate concern, is from the fraternal order of police and the police chiefs association is how do we test for people that are high and driving right but it's happening now because right now the Rhode Island police Chiefs association and Sid Ward Dell its executive director has explained to me that they can only verify somebody's like marijuana card during business hours Department like of Health you, business hours? Yeah, because the only the only database they have is between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. If they pull you over and say, hey, listen, has this guy got a legitimate mm -hmm. card? There's, they don't even have that built in. So a lot of card before the horse. But it felt like this, this was kind of like compensation in the category of marijuana, and they probably overshot the target. And I wonder, and I think this is what Le uh, Representative Lima is, in, is referring to, what's really going on here? And what really is the investment structure, who's involved, bada blah, bada blah, 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 blah. I mean, it's opening it up to, to large moneyed interests. You know, the, the, we've changed the yearly fee to half a million dollars per compassion center. I think we're opening it up for large out-of-state California, New York, York moneyed interests to come in here and take over our distribution network. Hmm. Overall, what was your take 
on the, the budget process this year? I think overall it's a standstill budget. Now, what have we done to make Rhode Island... Not in terms of its value, but in terms of its impact. Well, I don't see anything in here that I mean, I'm encourages the, the total cap. price. The total price. Ten billion dollars. I think it's shocking. Yeah, it's ten thousand dollars for every man, woman, and children, children and child in Rhode Island. I, I think it's a lot of money, and I don't know that we've done anything differently to encourage capital investment in this state. We have a lot of government handout programs. We're giving twenty million dollars to to the movies. We're giving twenty-five million dollars to the Fane Tower. But what are we doing to encourage why organic we capital? Up, why do we end up state funding the Fane Tower? Because Other than just labor's demand for it, and the Senate really has been driving that part of it because they want that thing up and they want the discretion to kind of brush Providence aside. And this is what they got to be able to say, hey, listen, we now decide whether or not that sucker and that whole 195 property is going to be developed and how. That was unique. It was outrageous because if you look at the law, it sets it up for further usurpations of local control throughout the state. You know, that law that we passed wasn't just the 195 land. It essentially said any time the legislature can now come in, designate any piece of state property that's 20 plus acres, and basically cut the towns out. So that's a real problem. Was there enough fight about that? I mean, we fought it. We fought it. The people from Providence fought it. But for years, we've been yelling about usurpation of local control with little bills here, little bills there they do to take away zoning. People from Providence didn't stand up and stand with us and say you shouldn't be doing this. And Everything I, is circumstantial to their own particular immediate crisis needs. I said on the floor, Providence, your chickens have come home to roost. We've been yelling about this for five years and you voted against us every time. Not one Providence rep ever stood up and voted with us when the state was taking away local control of zoning and planning. And here we are. This is a, a wholesale usurpation of planning and zoning. And it's fell in Providence's lap. And unfortunately, it may fall on our laps in the future in other towns because it's setting up a horrible precedent. Any successes in the budget via the Republican perspective? We'll talk about it next. All right, by the way, this thing really sucked the oxygen out of the room, didn't it? It, it really, really did. The, the drama surrounding uh, the codification of Roe v. Wade was fill in the blank. Which drama storyline are you referring to? I mean, the the, the pen or the whole thing? The, oh, the pen. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, the pen. We didn't get to the Anastasia Williams thing. Well, we did last week. I think we showed. Did we show the video on that? Uh, and either, yeah, we did. We did. But she keeps. She's like doing cameo performances on, on this whole thing uh, in the media. Uh, Representative Williams, who is tardy in showing up to the show, even though every time she sees me, she says, "Dan, why don't you have me on your show?" Uh, Something else, but the but the major debate uh, over the whole thing and the Senate drama, yeah, you know, and then the quick return by the House in moments, uh, it was unnecessary, in my view. Unnecessary to do? Yes. Agree completely. And it was, it was I see it as an expansion. It, it took up so a lot. Of, it took a lot, of, a lot of the you know, the, it's the cliche, the oxygen in the room and a lot of energy from a lot of legislators. I think the Democratic Party saw it as something they had to resolve. I mean, it was tearing the Democratic Party apart, and I think that's where a lot of the push came from. Did you feel like a spectator in the whole thing more than anything else? I don't think that, frankly, I think the Senate heard our issues with it more than the House did. You know, our House debate was first in March, and we raised the issues of specifically the, the D. The quick child stuff. The, the quick child, yeah. uh, the legal status of a, a fetus. They didn't fix it. I think Archambault originally tried in his... You made, I am, I'm only recollecting right now, pardon me, summertime is getting into my head. <laughs> you made terrific arguments uh, in our last visit about the problems with it, including the respect for life um, in the heinous situation of a, a mother who loses her life um, by murder homicide that the definition of the life of the baby, if she was pregnant, um, was being removed. Now the Attorney General says he can beef up the, the penalties in case two lives are lost and something like that. But you made great arguments. And, and they, it wasn't and, fixed. And, and they stuck, but they stuck to the Senate, at least to the point where Senator Archambault said, these points are well made, and we need to at least do something about it. It was addressed in the sense that they're adding, they're beefing up the auxiliary legislation, you know, to protect the, the baby, you sort of, <laughs> no, not they're, really. They're beefing up the penalties for assault on the mother. Right. So if you... If so, she's pregnant. Yes, if she's pregnant, and you know she's pregnant. That's one of the standards in there, but 
what it still does is it says there can be no crime against the viable fetus. And there may be tools in the toolbox and they may be able to prosecute someone and put them in jail for a long time, but laws are statements of values. And I don't think we should devalue a viable fetus when a woman's reproductive choice has been taken from her without her consent by some third party criminal. So I let the oxygen get sucked out of this segment. <laughs> Su success stories for you at all? In the budget? Yeah. One of the things we advocated for was reforming DCYF. We put in two budget amendments. One was to have them accredited by a national accreditation firm. And that was passed, not under our name, but our budget amendment was in. And my Democratic friends put in uh, a very similar budget amendment that passed, appropriating $500,000 to the accreditation of DCYF, which is necessary. Uh, it's an agency in crisis. Uh, so I would say that is our biggest budget success. But there were things that, frankly, were in the budget that were much better than the governor's. I think the governor's budget, with all the scoops, all the taxes that were going in, uh, were problematic. I think this budget is better than the governor's. It's not a change budget. So in general, you think the speaker did bring some discipline to it? He brought some discipline. I mean, I certainly wouldn't have written the budget that passed. But you don't like the mission statement. The mission statement, I believe, is government needs to orchestrate economic development. We are not going to change things to allow out-of-state organic money to come in here, or out-of-state money to come here to, to grow organically, to grow our businesses organically. It's kind of the government needs to try and control this economy. Do you, want a, do you want a hyper Ramondo strategy, or do you want to create fertile ground by a lower tax base and those kinds of overall incentives? The, the latter. Definitely not a Ramondo hand out cash to people that can convince you it's a good idea strategy. Mm -hmm. I don't think that works. It's central planning, and it's simply is doomed to failure. Makes sense to me. You got the 911 change. We did. We did. But so we advocated for a 911 change. They split the the fee into two separate fees: a restricted receipt account and then a first responder account. But then they raised the first responder amount. So they changed it, but then they jacked it up 25 cents on us. 25 percent, which is 25 cents. Well, it's all part of the. They need the money. One step forward, two back. <laughs> By the way, the uh, Republican Party chair and the uh, former gubernatorial candidate, Ken Block, are having a, their own prospective press conference in the State House tomorrow on the budget. Thought on that? I can't wait to hear what they have to say. Got it. Thanks for coming. Anytime, Dan. Blake Filippi, the minority leader. Be right back. So tomorrow, Phil West, former executive director of Common Cause, will be here. He's got a big to-do going on with the editor of the Providence Journal's editorial pages about the way they've written about Nellie Gorbea and some of the things that the Secretary of State is doing with election data. It's a whole kind of frittata, but he'll lay it out for us tomorrow on the program. Of course, we'll talk to you at 3 until 6 on WPRO. We thank you so much for tuning in. Have a great night.